The question just came up on our call about how soon should we start dating, get sexually active post-divorce? And this is like a toss-up question, and I'm gonna give a lot of perspective on this. And the most important, the most important pr perspective on this entire thing is, is that I've been coaching and working with men intimately for 18 years. This means I am with them. This doesn't mean that I just give advice and I'm in, in somehow detached. I am with them. and so. There's a lot, a lot to this. And the quick and easy answer is, is there's basically two roads and you have to be careful with both of them and it's okay to do either one of them. One is to not date for a long time and really look at yourself and work on yourself. And the other one is, is you can get started dating right away, be super careful, but you're going to have to look at yourself and work on yourself in tandem with all of that. But the explanation goes deeper we're on a rising man call. If you're interested in this stuff and you're a guy that wants to sort out the issues of the modern man's problems in the world today and all that sort of stuff, this is what our group does. So let's get started. All right, big thing here, big thing. And it's crazy because when we're a guy and we're going through a divorce, we get the guy side of the advice, which says go out and get laid. And part of that is right. Okay, but also part of it's wrong. If it's not serving you, it really conflicts with you and it makes you more confused, makes you want to isolate more. So if you're that guy that is like, man, I don't feel comfortable dating or having sex with anybody, I can't even imagine it, it traumatizes me. That doesn't mean you're weak, that doesn't mean you're bad, that doesn't mean really anything other than that is your state of being. But when you hear this advice, like let's go out and get laid, it can totally mess with you and make you feel more alienated, uh, alone, isolated, uh, that you're wrong in something. But even worse, you just stop talking to people. And when you're going through hard things in your life, it's very, very important to have a support system so you can go through them. Not because you're weak, it's so you can go through those hard things, you need a support system because going through those hard things is exactly what makes you strong and there is no other way around that. But then we get to this other side where there's a advice, and this is the, the dynamic, the problem in every single problem with the modern male culture is there's two pieces of bad advice. One is the PC feminine like BS, which actually works for some people. And the other one is the manosphere, you know, go out and get laid right away, which is not BS, but can be, right? So they're both right and wrong. So the PC culture answer to this is like, well, you gotta feel your feelings and you have to dive into that and this and that and the other thing and here's how you do it and you need to go into the feminine and then it becomes like evil and says, but if you don't do this, you're wrong and you're toxic and you need to do it right and stop talking like you're a man, give it up. And all of the anger of feminism and women and other people involved with this type of thought because it's not just that, it's like politically correct culture, all of that anger comes out to basically say, do this or else or do this because I don't want to ever experience the pain that I felt when my dad hit me or I got broken up with and, and humiliated at school or I did the wrong thing as a guy and, and you know all the guilt, all the unresolved bullshit of everybody comes out there. And both of them have that. The, the man advice that's screwed up and incomplete and the PC feminine advice that's screwed up and incomplete. And the main thing with this is that it's incomplete. So remember at the beginning of this, the most important thing here is that this comes from the experience of working with men. Now, I lean definitely towards, and here's the other big thing, is I started out as a dating coach. I got laid a lot. I lived for sex. I created a whole entire philosophy out of sex. I still live by it. I am proud of it. I teach it to people. I, you know, In our groups, they're a massive infrastructure of different lessons or there's a massive in infrastructure of different lessons and modules and stuff for people to work through. You could work through your entire life happiness through the practice of sex in my groups because that was the original course that started it out. To you were born to be social, you were born to be sexual. So the way you're social and sexual, you could do that. A lot of people don't like that, but you absolutely 100% can. So it's something that I believe in heavily, yet, in my experience with men, I realized some men don't want to start there. And so even though I see and know a complete, not an incomplete, a very complete path of sex and relationships, uh, intimacy, uh, rapport, connection, learning empathy, 
these are ways to go deep within the self and go deep within what I would call the soul of somebody and, and to get a great experience, a, a life-changing experience, a, a total self-help practice, whatever you want to call it. Even though that's there, that's not the starting place for some people. A good example of this might be if a, if a drug addict comes to me, which this is a big thing that I've worked in with a lot, and they say, I'm trying to stop this and that and stop using. I'm not going to start with that a boundary is pliable. And this idea, which is true, it's, it's absolutely true that boundaries are artificial man-made constructs because we cannot control something else. And, uh, you know, they're there so that we, we need to blur that boundary and so we can activate choice and have freedom of thought. Well, look, boundaries also are necessary for us to build certain things, create things, build nations, build mindsets, uh, create uh, self-love and self-worth in different ways, develop our own beliefs. Boundaries are necessary and, and they're not pliable, even though the end goal is to be able to mix and think and all those sorts of things. I know absolutely it, for a long part of my, or for my entire life, I'm going to have boundaries that I never am able to fully open. So I'm never going to tell that to a drug addict to start there. Uh, even though that is a principle of life that we want to move towards. I want him to stop. I want him or her to not use. I want him to do whatever he or she has to do to do that and to think that and then develop attributes based off of that. And then after years, and again, something I have a lot of experience with, especially with addicts, they can start looking. And I'm not saying that they start using again. I'm saying that they can start looking at how those boundaries could be reopened. And maybe they may have been too harsh, but they were necessary for the first two to five years of their recovery. And again, that doesn't mean that I'm telling somebody to use or whatever. Let's get off the addict topic because, again, with these different things, I have so much experience. I go off on all these tangents and it's how my brain works, yada, yada, yada. So when somebody's starting out with divorce and custody and they want to get sexual, they can. But the idea that they can get sexual and start dating just to bypass their thoughts and ideas is where that PC feminism culture is right. The answer that is given. It's totally right. You can't do that. You have to look at yourself. But what I found for myself and really not really for myself, more so in teaching thousands and I mean 18 years worth of people and in in front of them, with them, talking on the phone with them, like on a weekly basis, usually multiple times a week. If they did go that route of being sexually active afterwards, you totally, absolutely, 100% could look at yourself and I demanded it, always. From the beginning of our online program in 2009, even though I started coaching before that, in 2006 or something like that, but in 2009, we had an inventory that you did to base all of your social dynamics off of. So all the way you, every single way you talked to somebody was based off of something from your life and that went deep into your fears, your family, your desires, your wants. And your wants and desires, your level of gauging attraction wasn't just physical, it was thought, it was emotion, it was these different attachments that we had. These are things that I wrote about in 2009 before some of the psychological things were cool. But There were many people before me in the mental health realm that thought of these things too, which is where I got them from. So this was super important and emphatic, okay? Now, when you did that, there was probably going to be a lot of immaturity in it. There was going to be a lot of reactive, you know, uh, impulsivity to it. There was also going to be some bypassing in it that we knew, right? There's Because there always is going to be a little bit, okay? And this is where this this idea of finding the complete answer mixes both, right? So there was some bypassing, but we wanted to avoid bypassing, but we're still doing some of it. Yes, but we're devoutly looking at ourselves during the whole time. And then the practice of sex or dating or whatever it is has a, a, a very profound effect. Now, this is again, that turning point, that's a fork in the road is where that person am, is okay with that. Now, at some point in a single man's life, he's going to come upon that. And that could be a month. That could be a year. Uh, When my ex and I got divorced, this is me. Like, I had lived all over the world already. 
I'd had sex and dated and had relationships of all different kinds. So I I knew like when everybody's like, you just need to go out and get laid, man. I did that more than you could even imagine. Okay. And they're like, well, you, you just need to take it out on somebody or something like that. I did that more than you could ever imagine. Or you need to find another girlfriend or you need to find somebody that's younger and hotter. Did that more than you can imagine in the past. Like, so all those things, I did that, whether... I did that to cover up a previous relationship or I did that just to do it. Like I lived the definition of a man's sexual life, at least by my own definition, which is, that's all that really matters, right? But I mean, it, it trumps a lot of other people's. So I had done that. So I had done that by 2012 when I had met her. So in 2019, when we split up, it was like, man, that's not the answer. Now I'm going to come back to this because it kind of was the answer. Let's go to the other guy who doesn't feel comfortable having sex. And this is actually how I felt. I was repulsed by it. I had no sex drive. I did not want to do it. And here I am, the writer of a philosophy that's saying that if you are not sexually active and if you are not sexually satiated is, is really it, fulfilled, if you're not sexually fulfilled, you are mentally ill, you are incomplete, you are not of your nature. But I also knew in writing that, that that's not always the case. So in order to be a part of your nature, you need to eat or you need to uh, have your body working in a certain way. You need to sleep properly. There's going to be times where you're sleep deprived, you're not eating properly, or you're not using your body in the right way. Whatever the different attributes of your nature are, you're going to be in deficit of them and it's okay. That's also a part of the cycle of life. And I was like, when is this going to come? And then you start thinking, holy shit, I haven't gone through my you know, at the time, I think it was 13 years of going without sex for over two weeks. I had not done that from, let's say, the age of uh, 25, I'm making this up right now, but sometime around there, all the way to 42 or 41 or whenever we split up. So those things, it was like, wow, I have never done that. I, and I've never, ever had to be alone. Now, again, in PC culture, we get all these people that actually don't know, that are giving advice that sounds good, that are based off of studies, but have no experience. They're like, well, you need to be alone. You need to be alone with your pain and understand. And then they start saying of what you need to get in touch with and how you need to do it and all these things that they've never done. Well, let me tell you something. I know how to be alone at this point, big time. And I went very deep with it, which made me realize there was a whole megaphone of BS out there with it. So... I felt sickened at the idea of having sex with somebody else. I didn't want to do it. And then when I started to do it, it was like amazing because it was like riding a bike. I knew how to pick up women. And the first girl I picked up was in a bar and I had sex with her in a bathroom. And it was like the easiest thing to do. And it grossed me out. Not because of having sex in a bathroom grossed me out. Now you guys might be listening like Jesus, but I've, I've, Man, I've, I, I've done the quintessential life of traveling around the world and having sex in all sorts of different environments. And so in, uh, to a pickup artist, that's something to brag about. And like, you know, it, it was a, it's a pretty crazy story, actually. And so I hooked up with this chick in the bathroom. And part of the crazy story was that somebody walked in on us and I kicked the door shut and then continued to have sex. It's something that I've like done many, many, many times in my life of situations like that. And it just came to me, right? Because I'd done it so much, but it grossed me out and I didn't want to be there and I didn't want to have anything to do, but there was also a part of me naturally going on. And somebody would say, man, that's so sick or whatever. Man, it happened. It, it, was, it, it was an experience that helped me move past something, but it was gross. And guess what? It continued to be gross after that. The next person, and, and, and I waited. Actually, it's not true. I waited and then there were people that I could have hooked up with, but didn't. And then I was all afraid to and all this different stuff. And it just sickened me. And then I met a girl, which was crazy because it was almost the same situation. And, I, and this is why it's so important. Because this is what's going to happen to you. All this stuff that PC culture says is sick and not right and covering up something and it's whatever. And then all of the man side is saying, well, you got to do it. You got to press forward. And that's what they're going to get out of this. All of those things are interpretations of a fantasy of what healing looks like. Because what it was for me was I met a girl who 
we just met up to have sex. And it was sick in all the ways uh, that PC culture would say. And it was like machismo, awesome. It's actually another cool story that is just crazy and kind of can't believe I lived. And when I meet her, we have no attachment. We had a lot of sex. I, I forget, I'd have to look at what I wrote on the boards, but I don't know if I had 20 condoms with me or 30, but in three days we went through all of them and we had a lot of sex. And we both had a lot of problems in our lives. Uh, man, there's so much to this woman. I, I really care about her a lot and we went on to have a relationship and there's a huge amount of respect that I have for her in all sorts of ways. Guys in the group know who she is. But she changed a lot in me and she held my hand and I held her hand through a huge change that we made. But it started out with sex, just sex and only sex and fucking for fucking. And it, and it made me feel bad and it made me feel sick and it made me feel good and it made it seem beautiful. And this thing that happened at the same time, but it happened so much and for a long period of time, like having sex, you know, minimum 20 times in three days, you're having it for a long time. You got to sort through you in sex. I got to sort through me in sex. She got to sort through me in sex. And we continued dating on and off or, you know, whatever. We didn't live in the same city. We continued dating for 18 months. And at the end, she was basically like, I want kids or get married. And I was like, man, no, 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 no. Not going to happen with me. Not going to happen. And so she cut it off. And she had said, you know, this is so crazy because I hated men for so long and I thought being in love was stupid. In fact, on our first, that first three days, there's a video of her saying, uh, can you believe it? The last relationship I had, which was like four years prior or something, can you believe it? I cried for this guy. It's so stupid. You should never cry for a man. And when the day we broke up 18 months later, she was crying and I said, look, you're crying. And she says, yeah, I know. It's so good. I could learn to love again. And it, it's so, uh, such a beautiful thing. That came from sex. That came from sex in the illest form of what PC culture says is bad. Yet it attained one of the things that PC culture guarantees it will get from its bullshit prescription. And it started out in what men's culture that's naive and immature says is the best way to go, yet it moved in this direction of that wasn't just about dominance and being better and never having to be responsible for what you put forward because you're a guy and that's your right or whatever it is. Those things all got to be felt and it started out that way, yet it turned into something that was so human and so beautiful that it doesn't own a side to whatever political or social BS there is. So this is, you know, why I think sex and, and philosophy go hand in hand. And it's a force of nature. And, it, you know, it's beyond uh, human thought, I'd even say, or it predates the idea of thought and what philosophy and societies and histories could do for man and da da da. So it's really a special thing. And this is why also I say for divorced men, it is such a blessing. You may not think this now that you're put in a place of hard things. Uh, and I'll say this over and over again of two different things that don't make sense. I have to hate somebody, but I have to forgive them. Or I, for, I need to forgive them. I need to forgive them. One side of it is you have to forgive, but you can't help but hate. And they, they go together. It's like, I can't help but feel I'm sick while I'm pursuing sex or being sexual. And I miss my ex. I don't miss my ex. I'm just sick by it, whatever it is. And I want to, I want to have sex. I want to, I want to dominate. I want to have promiscuity. I want to have power. I want to have that. You need to actually put it into application in a safe way while looking at yourself. And this is the only way to have the human experience. And with divorce and custody, it presses upon us a, a place for man and in nature to define our moral code. And our moral code never fits evenly into it. Our virtue never fits evenly into it. And it, it, and it contradicts each other. It gives us an opportunity to understand the two. All right, because experience is your teacher. To hear what chocolate tastes like 
is a great, great thing, but you can never know it until you taste it. And if we are men that talk about honesty, we talk about integrity, we talk about life after divorce, and we pass on any advice to another man in pain without experience, we are the great liars of our culture. And sadly, that is who is giving information today. In any case, if you'd like to hear more about this philosophy, get started and check out the links down below. The groups are awesome. They're good. Finally, guys gave me some video testimonials. That's the other great thing about divorce and custody is when you have that, people are much more open to speak about it after their cases are done. And so it's an amazing, amazing group and we do awesome stuff. All right. I'll talk to you guys later and we'll get back to the call.